Okay, good evening. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to sort of bring this all to a close, albeit I will be handing over to uh, General Tim afterwards. Um, look, I'm, I'm not going to concentrate on the history. I'm going to try and concentrate on the future and the here and now and try and draw it together and what does it mean for us? Because whilst I do love the study of history um, and it is incredibly enjoyable and important from a historical perspective and building identity and culture and the like, as the head of regiment today, as a still serving officer, I'm interested in what are the lessons for the future? Have we learnt those lessons? And will, we, and will they remain relevant into the future? And how do we make sure we don't forget them? To go to one of the questions earlier, because we do have a habit of losing our lessons. So we saw that we've gone from uh, a gunner journey that started with a pretty challenging, at a pretty challenging point, a paucity of artillery, poor command and control, you know, technical limitations, uh, poor ammunition, uh, poor logistics and the like, through a period of four years of huge change, not just in the way the artillery wages war, but the way that we waged war as a combined force. But we see manoeuvre, combined arms manoeuvre warfare at its birth. We see the advent of aero peas and really the nailing of indirect fire and a range of other things. So these are important things for us today. This slide summarises the broad themes and things that I think remain, remain relevant today. And if you give me a few minutes, I'll take you, I'll take you through them. Um, many of the lessons here, as we've heard earlier, are not new. You know, and everything old is in fact new again, in my view, um, but, but always with a twist. If I can put some things in context, we've come from an era of the last 15 to 20 years of focusing on the war, and that was predominantly Afghanistan, albeit more recently in Iraq, places like East Timor. And we're now re-emerging into a different world where, in my day job, as I said earlier, I think about these sorts of things, where we have the re-emergence of the potential of state-on-state -state conflict and high-end warfare. So we do have to relearn these lessons. Someone mentioned earlier the Russians getting their, you know, falling in love again with, uh, with indirect fire. Um, that is absolutely true. I don't think they ever lost the love of it. Um, but you, as we saw in the Ukraine, extensive use of rockets and guns, um, doing you know, amazing uh, damage to Ukrainian forces. Uh, we've, got, we've got the North Koreans still flexing their muscle. And as I said earlier, I spent a month on the peninsula and most of what we concentrated on was the counter-battery fight in the first stages of the war. You know, when you've got thousands of guns arrayed across the other side of the DMZ, all within range of Seoul, you've got to win the counter-battery fight pretty quickly. And so all of the manoeuvre in the first part of the war is about suppressing those guns before you think about anything else. So we're talking about core level, divisional level manoeuvre. We're talking about the massing of fires. You know, ultimately the massing of fires is what differentiates us as gunners from the mortars of the infantry battalion. You know, if we can't mass our fires across boundaries of battalions and brigades and divisions, we're nothing more than a glorified mortar platoon, slightly higher calibre, but that's about it. So that's what it's, what it's all about. We need to operate in a contested air environment and survive, and gunners play a role in both maintaining that environment and utilising the environment. So the broad themes there, let me just dwell on, 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 on them a little bit at the top there. Uh, ben James mentioned accelerated warfare. Um, we are facing a technological threat or a technological uh, evol evolution cycle which is accelerating. <coughs> We've always had technological advancements, but it is accelerating at an exponential rate at the moment. 
We've got increases you know, as it relates to artillery, in increased precision, the use of artil uh, artificial intelligence potentially, and the application of big data, amongst many, many other things. We've got new effects being developed, not just in a munition sense, but cyber and in other domains we have effects that can be del delivered which need to be coordinated and synchronised and that is, that, that is falling more and more regularly to the JFEC to wrap in and coordinate and synchronise. We have a shrinking workforce and uh, in line with that shrinking workforce we have old capabilities that need to be maintained and all these new capabilities that need to be brought into service. So how do we get the most out of our people? And people are important because you still need boots on the ground to win a war. You still need to put soldiers into the field to dominate populations, to take terrain and the like. So how can you maximise the people in that particular sphere and do it with less in others? How resilient are we in the people space? You know, we are used to taking very few casualties through the current war, the wars we have fought recently. And whilst it's tragic for people to lose their lives, you know, we need to be thinking about how resilient we are if we are starting, if we're potentially going to take dozens, if not hundreds of casualties in a single day, which some of the scenarios of future war and, the, and what we learnt from World War I could unfold. And how do we train future artillery commanders? And it goes to the question that was raised earlier in Jason's presentation about you know, the f a future coxswain. You know, we can't rely on serendipity. And you know, a point I'd make is, you know, I, I attended the gunnery staff course in the UK, 12 months intensive training, brought back to the school to be an IG, to pass on all of that knowledge. That exchange has gone. And if there's one thing I could bring back, it would be to bring back that exchange and to bring back putting a warrant officer on the gunnery career course, to be the core of that, to build that knowledge and to reinvest it back into the RAA back here. The other thing that worries me about growing our future workforce is, and it comes out of you know, what Jason and what we've been hearing about the technology, technological piece, is as we get more and more technical, we get more and more specialised. And so how do you build a commander that can see the whole lot? And you know, I was down at the school last week and you know, a, lot, a, a large slice of every course is about ones and zeros. It's about joining networks and about making equipment work, which is great, I think, if you're a bombardier and a soldier, but it's not what I particularly want young captains to be taught and it's not what I want majors to be taught. I want majors to step back from that equipment and be able to see the battlefield, understand the combined arms team, and then understand the role of artillery and how to employ the artillery in that environment. And so the days of, you know, subbies coming off regimental officers basics courses, being able to do everything on the gun position are gone. And I'm pretty comfortable with that, because if we try to make the masters of doing everything on the gun position, they won't be masters of their own job. So we need to make sure we're training our soldiers and our NCOs and our warrant officers to do what warrant officers and NCOs and soldiers do best and let the, let the officers concentrate on being, for want of a better way of describing it, the brains of the outfit to bring the whole lot together and bring it to its maximum effect. So that leads to what I think you know, one of the biggest lessons out of out of World War I was learning loops and innovation. And we need to be that force again. And uh, I don't think we've got the luxury of a four-year world war to innovate. You know, we've got to be able to innovate quickly off the line of march. We've got to build innovation into our daily psyche. And we've got a defence force and we've got an army at the moment that talks about innovation incessantly. We create innovation hubs and innovation days. You know, I'm being a little bit cheeky here, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit out of my box perhaps, but I reckon the one way to stifle innovation is to label it and give it an organisation. You've got the innovation organisation. That's not the way to innovate. The, innovate is, the way to innovate is to accept failure. And so to the young officers sitting in the room, you know, many of whom worked for me when I was a CO, you 
You know, it's about going into the field and pushing things to failure. It's about pushing people so that they find where their boundaries are and they get to, they get to then learn and adapt and move on. It's about trying new ideas and accepting that not all new ideas will succeed. And we should be applauding people who try and fail rather than applauding people who don't try and never fail. And I know it's a difficult, it's a difficult balance. And when I did say that to my regiment many years ago, I had the RSM come up to me afterwards and say, you can't say, sir, that you're going to take you to the field so you, and, and make you make mistakes. That's just not what we do. I said, that's not the kind of mistake I meant. It wasn't about firing outside the STA. It was about, it was about you know, testing the limits. So learning loops are critical, as, as critical today as they were then. There's also the related issue of technical versus tactical gunnery, and this is, this is one that's pretty near and dear to my heart, because I would consider myself to be a technical and a tactical gunner, but more importantly, those of you that know me say, I think I say that neither of them exists, it's just gunnery. And you can't apply the effects of artillery in any setting unless you understand both the technical aspects of the trade and the limitations that technology puts on your ability to do things. And you've got to similarly understand tactics. And it's not tactics of artillery by itself, it's the tactics of the combined arms team. It's the whole piece and the employment of artillery. You bring the two together and you're actually effective. Why is it important to me, you know, as a, as a junior officer, you know, I, I, I was labelled a technical gunner and it was, almost, it was almost spat at you by those that professed themselves to be the better gunners that you're just a technical guy, you know, we're the tactical guys, you know, you've got, you got, you got nothing to play in this space. Hence, I think we're at the place where we have been over the last few years where many of the things that we should have never given up were given up. You know, survey, met, you know, uh, plenty of other things without a fight, a bigger fight than we, we, we put up. You know, because how can you hope to solve the gunnery problem if you've got no way of getting correction at the moment? So we do need, you know, those lessons that were hard won in World War I remain absolutely relevant today. So I reject the notion of technical and technical gunnery. It's just gunnery. And if you're not, a, if you're not any good at it, you can't do it, full stop. So with, that, with those top broad themes, what I would say is, in, in, in all of that, what I'd say is today, the people, the gunners of today are, are as good as any gunners in the past. They just, we need to equip them to reach their full potential. We've got people that are passionate, We've got people that are incredibly capable within the paradigms that they exist. We need to set them up for success because they'll be the future commanders. One of them will stand up here one day, potentially, um, you know, given an address like this. So we need to make sure they are able to live up to the full potential and deliver the artillery capability that the Australian Army, the Australian Army deserves. Look, uh, and then there's the five threads there. We've done those, we've done those to death. Um, tonight already, but if I could just, you know, pick up on a few key points. You know, decentralised control, centralised command, absolutely sacrosanct in my view, and it needs to be going forward. But there are forces at being in the, current, in the modern army that think ownership means responsiveness. You know, you can't have, you know, I need to own the guns in order to guarantee myself the effect of the guns. You know, there are commanders out there, you know, they, ha they, they, they don't understand the notion of direct support or reinforcing fires and, and we've got to do better to educate them as gunners. That ownership doesn't matter. It's about responsiveness that matters. It's about priority of effort, not ownership. It doesn't matter how big or small the AO is. It doesn't matter whether it's a high intensity or a low intensity conflict. You know, you need to have the most flexibility in your artillery capability. And I think we've forgotten a whole bunch of this stuff too because, because of the way we approached Afghanistan. 
You know, we outsourced our indirect fire support to the Air Force, the Coalition Air Force, and to a couple of mortar, mortar, platoon, mortar tubes that might have been behind us, or to some Dutch SP guns. And as a result, we lost our understanding of what it is to orchestrate fire support across many different valleys, potentially, at the same time. On a really positive note, the DIV Joint Fires and Effects Coordination Centre was stood up again a couple of years ago under the, uh, under the command of uh, Colonel Nick Foxall. Um, and in the two or, th two or so years, the two years they've been around, um, with Major General uh, Paul McLaughlin as the DIV commander, they have been incredibly effective at bringing some of these lessons back together and getting them prominent in some of our higher level exercises in particular and influencing others, in particular Air Force, about the, what, the importance of indirect fire support and how it comes together. And when I say indirect fire support, I mean all elements of the system. I'm talking about weapon like uh, surveillance and target acquisition as part of that broader system. I am worried about command and control. We have AFATADS now, which is the modern version of the wireless, and it's, you know, it joins everything up, and it's fantastic when it works. And you know, when you're trying to mass fires of more than one regiment, it comes into its own, absolutely comes into its own. But we need to figure out how we do it when there's no comms, because the old adage, no comms, no bombs, kind of still rings true. And I note that the last time we did a div artillery level concentration was in 2008 when I was a CO. You know, we need to fight to get another div arty concentration together and I will be taking that to the Chief of Army when I do my farewell interview with him as, as head of regiment. But uh, when we did that in 2008, it was three COs got together and did it ourselves because no one else cared at that stage. So we need, to do, we need to do more to bring that together so we can educate our young officers about the importance of above regimental activity. To go to one of the questions earlier tonight, you don't know what you don't know and it's better to see it and experience it. And I had young FOs say to me, oh, sir, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not the way we did it in Afghanistan, which is guaranteed to make me cranky. Um, and then I just simply, you know, I could easily trip him up by you know, having a different survey problem and all that sort of stuff as he's trying to fire three batteries from three different regiments. So, um, illustrate the problem through conducting those sorts of exercises and perhaps re reinstating the Joint Fire CPX down at the school. Combined arms, you know, well and truly, well, well and truly understood by the Australian Army. We have practiced it since World War I and we've never really forgotten it at the, at the company, battalion, and brigade level, um, less so at the divisional level, I guess. But you know that relationship, FO to company commander, BC to uh, battalion commander, etc. Really solid. We need to continue to practice it, though. We shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, there are people that would seek to unpick it. So there is a idea floating around army that we need to pull all the regiments out of the brigades and create a a artillery brigade. You know, I am vehemently against that notion because you're going to break the goodness out of the system and the last thing the Australian Defence Force needs is another headquarters. You know, we can achieve that effect a completely different way by making the Div JFEC more powerful, uh, give it more authority to be a technical control, provide technical quality across the entire force without commanding everything and telling everyone they're not working for their brigade commanders anymore. But the last thing we need to do is take another 60, 30 to 60 gunners off the gun line in order to finance and pay for a headquarters. In a combined arms sense, I think there's some areas we really need to concentrate on um, to take forward. And I've mentioned one already, the divisional level, but the other one is in, the other two are logistics and move mobility and manoeuvre. You know, I think we have lost the art of um, understanding how the battlefield works in a movement sense. You know, getting onto and off the MSR, the sequencing of movement when you're in a congested battle space. Um, you know, I, I, I use Korea as an example because it's where I was earlier this year, but you know, number of very tight and strictly controlled MSRs, how do you get onto and off the MSR? 
what priority is the guns compared to the manoeuvre forces, what priority is the guns compared to rations. You know, those sorts of issues we need to get better at because that's as equally as part of the combined arms team as the armour, the engineers and the infantry. And the other one is logistics. You know, early in the series we heard about, you know, many times through the series we heard about the number of rounds fired. Now we're never going to get anywhere close to that, I suspect, but, um, but just the sheer logistics of moving 155 ammo would break the back of most brigades, you know, if we were to get into some real rate sort of engagements. So how do we do it? How do we move it? How do we break it down? How do we make sure it's prepared right so when it turns up on the gun position it can actually be thrown into the breach straight away without going through a massive process of unpacking it and all that kind of stuff. They are big, difficult conundrums that we need to think about if we're going to be relevant. Target acquisition and artillery intelligence, there's a lot being said about that. Why is this important now? Because A, because it's always been important, but B, we are going to embark on a long range fires project. We will get a rocket type of system. Um, what it looks like, I don't know, um, but if you can imagine an MLRS style thing um, that has utility at l much longer ranges than is currently possible, but you know, utilising that to its full effect requires target acquisition systems that are well linked into the artillery network um, and reinforced by artillery intelligence. And you know, with uh, 20 STA, it's a great regiment. It went on that UAV journey. Uh, UAV is the modern version of the Air OP, it's just the bloke's not sitting in the aeroplane, he's sitting on a console back home. Um, great capability, but as we migrated to that capability, we lost something and we, without blinking, and it was artillery intelligence. And the artillery intelligence piece, as we've seen through the lessons of World War I, is fundamentally important to understanding the enemy's design for battle and also then being able to prosecute the counter-battery fight. So we need to get better at art artillery intelligence and learn, relearn the lessons in order to make sure the long range fires project is able to deliver what we need it to deliver for the future. Because I'll tell you, you, know, you, you might have done counter battery in Helmand, absolutely, but counter battery against a couple of lone rockets compared to counter battery against you know, a 300 millimetre smirch battery uh, or the DAG and the RAG is a fundamentally different proposition. And if you get it wrong, you don't, you don't stay around for very much longer. Air land integration. Look, a couple of things there. It's about the air, the air threat and it's about our use of the air to support us. And the air threat, you know, there will be, we can't assume air superiority anymore. And that's why 16 Air Land Regiment is getting um, a project land 197 Bravo you know, a new integrated air and missile defence capability over the next few years, 2022-ish. Um, really, really important. But what I do know, that is, a, that is a massive mission set. And at the moment, 16 Air Land Regiment has got a number of other things it does. It's got sense and worn radars for counter-battery, no, not counter-battery, but uh, counter-rocket and mortar stuff. It's got the Air Land Troop with JTAC Troop in it. Um, and it's got an air defence role. My view is, Air to integrated air and missile defence is a 100% time consuming job and that if people are, there's, there's talk of giving the long range fires capability to 16 because it's a rocket and they fire rockets, you know, the, it's, 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 it's a nonsense. So we need to make sure we understand what the mission is and how complex it is and the cognitive ability of our people to execute that mission. And if I was CA-16, I'd want him to be concentrating on delivering of integrated air and missile defence and forgetting everything else. So that all belongs somewhere else. And then in the air environment, you know, uh, the enemy has great uh, air defence assets themselves. So what is the role of the gunners in suppressing enemy air defence assets as we try to gain local air superiority or to, bomb or to engage targets in support of the land battle through close air support? And the other bit of it is airspace coordination. Who's doing that for the land force? You know, we've got a proliferation of unmanned aerial systems on the battlefield. We've got weapon systems that fire with higher trajectories now that are not within our purview. You know, they're run by uh, armoured corps or, or uh, you know, infantry with 60 millimetre mortars and the like. We've got more rotary wing assets flying around. Who's doing that airspace coordination? It's something that 16 Air Defence Regiment used to do. 
something they need to get back into the heart of doing, and their lessons from the First World War. And the last point I'd have is about ammo. You know, we've heard it before, it is the weapon of artillery, and we are still firing the M107 round um, out of the 155, and it is an old round that doesn't fragment particularly well, old technology. Um, we do have a new family of ammunition inbound, and it's really, really impressive stuff. Um, you know, lots of different effects, better fragmentation, uh, different fuses to allow us to deliver different, different effects at the target end. But what I would say, the lesson I'd say here is not everything is PGM. And I think World War I showed us that, you know, the suppressive nature of artillery fire, you know, and every war ever since has shown us about the importance of the suppressive nature of artillery fire. Um, one of the lessons we potentially learn erroneously out of the current fight in Iraq is that everything is a PGM. So we have dropped and fired PGMs ad nauseum at a range of targets uh, without really thinking very much about consumption rates and, and the like. And, uh, you know, we need to be really attuned to the fact that they are in small quantity compared to the rest. So you need to have your attack guidance matrix and all those other things done so you make sure you're not firing, you know, the Hellfire or the Excalibur artillery round at a tractor. You're firing it at the enemy's command post because you know the general's in there kind of thing. Um, you, need to, you need to understand that. The other thing about PGMs is you've got to have the ISR to match it. So if you want to fire a PGM at a target, you've got, to actually have, you've got to actually know where the target is. So that's really tough in a modern contested battlefield. You're not going to have that degree of certainty. So how do we get that certainty or do we fire other rounds at it? And so the suppressive nature of dumb bombs, I think, is important. The other thing with that ISR piece is it takes time to acquire those coordinates for in the deep fight in particular. So, you know, I, I just liken it to if, if you wanted to fire a PGM at an infantry company position, you need to know the geo coords of 50 pits, 52 man pits probably, in order to get the rounds on each of those pits. Well, you could just probably just fire six rounds fire for effect from a battery, uh, you know, dumb bombs, you know, with a good, with a good grid, with, uh, you know, the gunnery problem solved, and you're probably going to have a better effect to support the infantry in their manoeuvre than, and it's probably going to cost you a damn sight less than firing, um, you know, 50, $100,000 artillery projectiles. So it's all about horses for courses. They're important. Um, and the other point I'd say is, and I've, I've covered it before, is, the Achilles heel with everything to do with ammunition is logistics, logistics, logistics. So how do we make sure we as gunners understand what that might look like and then have that conversation with the loggies in the brigades and the division and the rest of army to ensure they understand that if they want us to contribute to the combined arms fight, they've got to give us a priority for the wagon train. You know, and we learnt that lesson through World War I. I think, you know, ultimately, um, you know, there's a bit of a moniker we have now in the, in, the, in, the, in the current, you know, RAA that describes what we do, you know, accurate, responsive, dependable and joint. And I think that wraps it up pretty well, you know, we are accurate. I chose, we chose that word delivery, we didn't, we didn't put precise, you know, we are accurate. We're accurate in everything we do, whether it be a drill in the command post, whether it be the round we put on target or the missile we fire or the UAV we fly. We're responsive in that we do it quickly. We do it when the commander needs it, when the infantry and the armour out on the ground require it so that they are removed from harm's way as quickly as possible. We're dependable because we are part of a big team and we are there whenever they need us. And lastly, we are joint because ultimately we fight in a joint environment and we are army's conduit, in my view, into the joint fires arena. Air Force says they do joint fires, they don't. They provide air support that contributes to joint fires. Artillery indirect fire contributes to joint fires, but there's one node in the land battle space that actually truly does joint fires, and it's the JFX. It's the JFTs and the JFX at various levels that bring all of those things together from all of the services to create joint fires. 
So in closing, um, I'd just like to do a couple of things if I could. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank tonight's presenters and the panel members for uh, some excellent presentations and some stimulating, stimulating discussion. I would like to thank all of the presenters from the last 11, uh, the last 10 events. Personally from me, I know General Tim's going to make another, uh, also thank you. Um, I would like to make a special call out uh, to the serving military officers who took the time to write papers and come and present. Um, not to say that their contributions were any more important or any more impressive than anyone else's contributions, but I was really impressed to see young serving um, officers and NCOs take the time to invest in their history and then applying it to the, to the future. And uh, yeah, we need, uh, there's lots of retired gentlemen here who have taken an active interest yeah, we need to be able to have people to take their place in due course and so I encourage all of the current serving gunners uh, to take an interest in their history and to put pen to paper when and if you can in order to join the debate. I'd like to thank the uh, RAAHC for sponsoring this on behalf of the regiment. Um, I know it's been a massive, a massive undertaking, you know, uh, Ben James mentioned it himself, you know, it is it takes a lot of effort to pull something like this together and to do it as professionally as we have done. And in, uh, in, in that vein, um, Kelly, can you just grab the thing off the, under my desk, under my chair there? In, in, in that vein, I would like to uh, make a final uh, presentation. Um, late last year or earlier this year, I can't quite remember, um, I discussed the idea of creating a head of regiment commendation um, with a few people. Uh, to sit outside of the honours and award, the normal honours awards thing, for to recognise people uh, who we think have done great work uh, on behalf of the gunners, whether they be gunners or not, or serving or retired, people who do things to advance our cause, to uh, represent us well, um, or who just excel in their day to day day to day work. Um, I've only I've only issued a couple of these. Uh, I was fortunate enough, the Artillery, Australian Artillery Association, I mentioned it to them and they went and uh, found some funding and they managed to produce a, uh, a very impressive commendation. And so with that in mind, I would like to make a, uh, a presentation tonight uh, to Nick Floyd um, for his work, um, not just in pulling together uh, this series of presentations, which has taken a huge amount of time and effort, including whilst he was in Baghdad, uh, deployed. He still used to email me with all sorts of things about artillery and, you know, is this thing's going well and you need to lend your support as head of regiment to this and that, etc. Absolutely devoted to the cause of this seminar series. Um, and secondly, for in excess of about five years, he was also the president of the RAA Association of the ACT. And, uh, yeah, that's not an easy job um, to herd the cats because then some of the cats uh, don't listen very well. Um, including me, um, and just you know, getting things to happen and making sure our you know, new, new lieutenants coming out of RMC are, are appropriately looked after at every graduating class and all of those kinds of things and, uh, and getting us together as a community. And so for that, Nick, I would like to uh, give you uh, a Head of Regiment commendation. 